OK, uh, I'm going to. Uh, spend this class period um, um, going over what I think is um, most important um, promise and preparation for tomorrow. Uh, so. Um, so this is again page 30 in the back of your packet. Uh, I'm going to start off with. Um, doing a related race problem. Um, and I uh, just now um, in the morning review session, I did a mean value theorem problem. Um, I did that. We did we did this one already in the packet, but I'll just kind of quickly uh, review through that process. And in my help session, I also just did a full curve sketch problem. We'll do that again in class um, just to get that additional practice, even, even if you just did it uh, from the review session, help session. See if we can, uh, let's see if we can um, do it on our own. Um, and after that, um, I'll want us to review some of our derivative rules. Okay. Um, I have an implicit um, problem involving trig that um, I have up on the board, so we'll do that. Uh, I'll uh, revisit a particle motion problem that's in the uh, help session packet that I want to uh, go over with you. And um, I think, yeah, hopefully by the class, we would have hit um, the majority of the topics that you can expect on uh, tomorrow's test. Um, again, um, no calculator, and I um, uh, will not be giving a you a blank in a circle, but I do have one right now. If you want to just use it to help yourself move towards being able to create a black unit circle um, on the test, I will give you as many scratches as you need. Um, but it's really just that first quadrant, get that first quadrant going, everything else will just kind of fall into place. Okay. Um, I will have a help session again tomorrow morning, revisiting the same topics um, for our test tomorrow. All right, so let's start off with that with this related race problem here. That you guys just picked up. Okay, so ship A is traveling due west towards the lighthouse. Ship B is um, traveling north away from the lighthouse, so. Let X be the distance from, um, uh, so let's see, um, and we know the speeds that they're traveling at. Let X be the distance between ship A and the lighthouse at time T, and let Y be the distance from between ship B and the lighthouse at, rock at time T. And find the distance in the kilometers between ship A and B when X equals four and Y equals three. So this is pretty easy, right? Um, if X is three and Y is four, then the distance between the two ships is what? Yeah, fine. I'll just call that Z here. Okay, Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Uh, find the rate of change in kilometers per hour of the distance between the two ships when X equals four and Y equals three. So what do you think we're looking for with part B? These DT, yeah. And to find these DT, we're going to have to go through what first? What equation will we start with to eventually get to DC DT? Yeah, but that theorem, right? So x squared plus y squared equals z squared. Okay, find the derivative. All the d over dt shows up. We have six variables that we're accounting for. And then we'll read the problem again and see if we can fill out all six variables.
OK, uh, <clears throat> ship A is traveling west. Towards lighthouse at a speed of 15 kilometers per hour, so what do we do with this number? Mm -hmm. And we assign it to what? DXDT, right? And we um, not because it's going left, but negative is because that distance is getting shorter, right? We expect that length of that triangle to get smaller over time as ship A is heading towards the, the lighthouse. Ship B is traveling north, away from the lighthouse at a speed of 10 kilometers per hour. So what can we do there? Yeah, 10 is what? DYDT, positive or negative? Positive, okay. Not because it's going north, but the more important thing is that that distance from ship B to the lighthouse is increasing, right? So represent that. Okay, we already did the Pythagorean theorem to find Z, so now we can just put everything in and solve for DZ, DT. Okay, these numbers should be manageable where we can do this without a calculator. Divide by 10. Units of measure. Miles per hour. Okay, so what does that negative, what does that tell us about this problem? <clears throat> negative six. Yeah, at this moment in time, the distance between ship A and ship B is what? Yeah, decreasing, right? And getting closer towards each other at that rate at that at this moment in time. Part C, let theta be the angle shown in the figure. <clears throat> uh, find the rate of change of, the, of theta. So what are we looking for? Theta dt. Okay. Are we forced into one trig function, or do we have a variety to choose from? Variety, because why? If we because we have every information that we need for every trig function, right? We have all three variables accounted for. We have um, all the d over dt's for all the sides, so we're not restricted because there's information that's missing from us. We have everything that we need. So we could use sine, cosine, or tangent, but we're forced to have to rely on what rule because of the way this problem is set up. Okay. Whether we use sine, cosine, or tangent, our right side will all be in terms of what? Will all be, do we have any, okay, fractions, um, but do we have any, how about variables versus constants? They will all be variables. Okay, so we have no constants in this problem, right? So as ship A and ship B are moving, that X, Y, and Z are all changing, right? It's not a problem where we can target a specific trig function because there's a constant that, that we want to use and avoid the quotient rule. Basically, we can avoid quotient rule. Now, not with this problem because all three parts are moving. So sine, cosine, or tangent, they all work. I'm going to just do tangent because that is those are the original variables that's given to me. But if you did sine and cosine, it, you would still get the same result. But I'm just going to do tangent. Okay. So tangent theta equals 
y over x. And it's important that we know why we use y and x and not 3 and 4 or 3 over x or you know y over 4, right? So we understand why those variables are there. Okay. Okay, so we find our derivative on the left side, quotient rule on the right side. And to become secant squared. Y over X, that's F prime G minus F G prime all over G squared. Okay, so just like what we said before, everything that we need, we have from part D. So dy dt we have, x we have, y we have, dx dt we have, x squared we have. But the one missing piece that we need to still look for is what? Secant of theta, right? We need to find secant of theta. So uh, we go back to our triangle here. I drew the triangle already with just theta and the sides accounted for. So um, what's secant of theta based off of this triangle here? Yeah, we know secant is the reciprocal of cosine. Cosine is 4 over 5. Secant must be 5 over 4. over 4, that's 25 over 16 after I square it. If I flip it over to the other side, it becomes 16 over 25. Okay, if you wanted to leave your answer like this, I would be okay with it. But you can also clean this up without too much difficulty, I don't think. Okay, what's our unit of measure here? Good. Always radians, never degrees, okay? Radians per. Per what? Power. Either one's fine. Okay, right, any questions with um, related rates? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, how do we get to tangent theta? Well, we know we have to build a trig function. Otherwise, we're not going to get to d theta dt. So um, based off of this problem here, we have all three variables, all derivatives. So I just decided to use tangent because um, I, those are the original variables given to me. So I did tangent theta equals y over x. But we have enough information from z and dz dt where you could do you could do sine of theta equals y over z and that will work go with that same process um, or if you want to do cosine of theta is equal to x over z that will work as well so in this problem we have three completely um, separate process you can go through and they will all work But regardless, we have to use either sine, cosine, or tangent. Otherwise, we're not going to have theta to begin, to begin with, and we're not going to be able to build and get to that theta. OK, good. Any other questions? Hopefully, you guys feel more comfortable and what you can expect on the test tomorrow in terms of process and steps. OK. Um,
I do want to. Um, no, just with the time that we have, I want to make sure that I get through everything. So a lot of these problems we've done already, so I'm just going to kind of walk through and talk through um, these these problems. Um, so um, for mean value theorem trick, derivatives average rate of change. This is uh, you can look on page two. Of your uh, original packet. This is not the help session packet. This is the review packet here. So I did this in the help session this morning, and we we should have already done this already. I just want to walk through the process again. So this is page two, number four. Yeah, this is help session probably. Um, we've done it already, so. In the interest of time, I want to walk through it, make sure that you guys are comfortable with these topics here. This is the object's uh, position is given by f of t equals 2 secant q t over 6 on the domain from 0 to 35. f of t is given in meters. Find the average velocity. So average velocity, average rate of change. I want to make sure we understand what that means. What's our process if I just ask you to find average rate of change? Is there any calculus involved? Is there any derivative involved? It's just you're just finding what? Yeah, change in well, change in yeah, change in position or change in y over change in x. Okay, so um, average rate of change is just slope. Okay, so you have to just understand. Okay, I should whatever if I can understand what slope is, I should be able to just adapt um, whenever I see average rate of change. So all I need to do is find the endpoints. Um, but we talked about how uh, with trig functions, you definitely want to spend the time to rewrite your problem, get that exponent to be a, a, a more kind of um, uh, easier to interpret location, get that bracket showing up. And then what we did was we plug in 0 and 2 pi um, into the original function. It's good to know that, um, you know, working with secant and cosecant, a lot of times we like to think in terms of sine and cosine. Get those unit circle values and then flip it, and those are your um, your um, trig values, um, numeric values. So plug zero in, plug two pi in, you get your order pairs, you get those y values, and then you just find slope. Right? So um, change in position over change in time, and that will give us 16 minus 2 divided by 2 pi minus 0, which is 14 over 2 pi, which is 7 over pi, so that is our average velocity, or in other words, average rate of change. So on average, this particle in that time period is moving at this rate, at seven lower pi meters per second. In part B, the direction says, when does the instantaneous velocity equal the average velocity? So if we just follow whatever the direction says, instantaneous velocity means find the derivative. Average velocity, we, we just found just slope between the endpoints. So we just set them equal to each other. Uh, the problem doesn't ask us to solve, it just wants us to set up that equation. So we do need to find velocity or the instantaneous rate of change. And that's just the derivative. Okay? So anytime you see instantaneous rate of change or instantaneous velocity, that's derivative related. Average rate of change, average velocity, that's slope related. They all kind of refer to the same thing, they're all talking about rate of change, but one is across um, a span of um, two time periods, and one is at a specific moment in time. Okay. So if I want to find the derivative, we have to recognize this problem as um, chain rule. Outsize derivative times inside derivative. So we took outsize derivative with their power rule. So six brackets squared, and then Inside function is secant of u, so secant of u becomes secant u tangent u, and then inside derivative one six t becomes one six. And we do some cleanup here. The one six and six can cancel out. Secant squared and secant can merge to be secant cubed. And so there's my um, instantaneous rate of change. This is my average rate of change. And you can ask us to set these up. Set them equal to each other.
Uh, from here, um, we did uh, what's an instantaneous velocity at t equals pi seconds. So now we're just taking what we built and just plugging values in. So we have our our velocity function, and it's asking us to figure out the velocity at a moment in time. So we just plug whatever the t value is into the derivative, um, using the circle values to plot to um, to evaluate. Part D is the same process, just a different um, t value. And then part E is just saying find the tangent line equation. So we have the slope that we got from part D. We do have to find the order pair. So 2 pi gets inserted back into the original function, gets to that y value, get your order pair, get your slope, point slope form. All right, I want to walk through the particle motion problem. Any questions here? Sorry, uh, I want to walk through um, curve sketching and then particle motion. So page six. I just did this in uh, the help session this morning. This is a really good one for us to um, be able to get through. So um, I want to walk through the problem that I did during the health session. OK, so we started off um, just find the derivative, right? Any curve sketching problem, you're just going to try to find your way to the first derivative function. Okay, we found the derivative. Uh, one half x becomes one half. Cosine x becomes negative sine. Two negatives cancel out. I get one half plus sine x. You're always setting your derivative equal to zero. And then your particle motion, uh, sorry, your curve sketching problem will be either sine or cosine. Okay, so be familiar with something that you've already seen that you've practiced with. Okay, you set your derivative equal to zero, solve, um, try to get that uh, sine x to be familiar here, sine x equals negative one half. So um, unit circle value, let's think about the fact that sine is negative in the third and fourth quadrant. It's in that pi over six family. Um, so seven pi over six and 11 pi over six. But uh, if we place them onto our sine line with our domain, um, restrictions, we see that 7 pi, 11 pi over 6 does not land nicely within our interval from negative pi to pi, so we have to make an adjustment. We have to subtract 2 pi from our original, our initial um, locations to see if they will, see if the coterminal angles will land inside the interval that we care about. So if I subtract 2 pi from 7 pi over 6, I get negative 5 pi over 6. That lands nicely between negative pi and pi, so we can keep that. And then 11 pi over 6, if I get that into the negative region here, subtract 1 pi over 6, I get negative pi over 6, negative 1, 6 is definitely between negative 1 and 1. So these are my critical points. I place them onto my slope sine line, and then now I'm just trying to choose values in the sub interval, test against my derivative function, right? My derivative function is my slope formula, and uh, I want to know the slope behavior of each of those intervals. Um, the nice thing I'm going to tell you is that your intervals are going to be oscillating. So if you can find out one or two, confirm those signs, then you can just um, change the signs between each interval. Okay. And your testing values, uh, choosing values in each sub interval, testing it, them against the derivative function, using your unit circle um, knowledge to, um, to conclude whether your interval is positive or negative. And if you know it's positive or negative, then you know. Um, where the graph is rising or falling. And if you know the graph is rising followed by falling, you know there must be a relative max. If it's falling will follow by rising, you know there must be a relative okay. So these points are important uh, because eventually we're going to have to graph these points, um, but we'll um, save that for later. We can now move on to the second derivative function. So um, start. Um, 
building off of that f prime, we can get to our second derivative function. One half becomes zero, sine becomes cosine. So there's my second derivative. Set my second derivative equal to zero. Cosine is equal to zero at pi over two and three pi over two. Um, but if I try to put pi over two and and three pi over two onto my um, <coughs> number line with my um, domain restriction, I see that three pi over two is clearly outside my interval. So I want to get it to the uh, negative region to see if I can land inside the interval. So I can subtract two pi from three pi over two. I get negative pi over two. And negative pi over two does land inside my interval. So I have nine critical points there. Negative pi over two and pi over two. I go to my concavity sign line, find values in each subinterval, but now I'm testing it against my second derivative function. All right. And if you don't recognize um, a radian measure because it's in the negative or it's too um, outside the interval that you recognize from zero to two pi, you can always add or subtract two pi to get it into an interval that you that, that you can recognize from your unit circle. Okay, a positive would be concave up, negative would be concave down. So we expect two points of inflection. Okay. Now these order pairs are not as important because they're just going to land inside along the path of my graph. Uh, what's important is being able to at least ballpark value where your uh, endpoints and your relative max and relative mins are so that you can plot the graph because we need to plot the graph to be able to um, conclude where your absolute max and absolute min is. You're just going to look at once you have your graph in front of you, you can just pick the highest and lowest points and those are your absolute max and absolute min. So um, I'm going to focus on my endpoints because I want to know where my graph is going to start and end. I'm also going to focus on my relative max relative min and they all get inserted into the original function because now I'm done with the calculus. Now I just want to be able to pinpoint where the points are so that I can, I can sketch my graph. So I'll give you um, some indication to help you with approximation. So I'll tell you, you know, use three for pi. I'll say, you know, for three over two, use 0. 0.7. And you're just using those decimals, you know, without a calculator, you're just trying to get some approximated value enough to kind of know where to sketch your graph. So I plug negative pi in and I got it down to a ballpark value of negative one half. Um, I plug pi into the original function. I got it with the ballpark that value to around 2.5. Um, negative five pi over six, negative pi over six, I got it to ballpark value of you know, negative three and negative one. And then you just plot those points onto your graph. And, and then once you um, sketch your graph, it should match the slope that you are ex experiencing on your slope sign line. It should rise to a relative max, fall to a relative min, and rise to a relative max. And once you have your, your original dotted line sketch, um, you know, you know, an idea where that graph is gonna live. And then to give it more detail, um, more curvature, now we can go to our concavity sign line, um, just estimate where those points are going to live and plot those points because you know points and flexions are going to land somewhere along that interval. And those points can now act as target points to kind of help you uh, build your curvature, right? So from first point to second point, that's going to be concave up, down, and then switch to concave up and then back to concave down. And obviously, by looking at the graph, you know, okay, that's my absolute max, that's the, my absolute min. Um, find those uh, approximated y values, and you can call those your absolute max, absolute min. Guys, I know you're working without a calculator, so you know, I'm not going to be, be um, you know, I'm, I'm going to be lenient in terms of your approximation, right? If you're a little bit off, but you still you still show your work and you understand the process. That's that's what I care about. I'm not gonna nitpick if you're off with your decimal value. Okay, good. Uh, curve sketching. Any questions? Okay. Um, in your um, test review packets. Um, this is a sorry help session help session packet. 
Um, I did some problems with this in my uh, help session, but um, page seven. There's a particle motion problem that I think is really good for us to to try. Um, I did. I have the, the key and the, the pay the problem all on the same page. Um, but if you want to grab a scratch sheet, you can uh, work out from or just follow along. Um, Wanted to kind of walk through it. OK, so particle motion problem here. This is um, given your position function is e to the cosecant of t on the interval from pi over 6 to pi over 6, find the velocity function. Okay. So find the velocity function. So if I want to find the velocity function, I have to find the derivative. To find the derivative, uh, what rule specifically do we have to involve here? E to the u times u prime. Okay. And also we have to involve cosecant's rule, right? Cosecant's rule is um, negative cosecant u cotangent u times u prime. So I'll build those together here. So if e to the u times u prime, so e to the cosecant of t times u prime, cosecant becomes negative cosecant u cotangent u times u prime, and t's derivative is just one, so it's not going to produce anything. Okay, part B says find where the particles at rest. So we have our part A here. We have our velocity function. Park what rest? What's our what's our next step? Yeah. So park what rest means that if my particle is not moving, if my particle is not moving, that means my velocity is zero. So I'm going to just basically set my velocity function equal to zero and try to solve for t. Now that we have this set up, which part can we focus on, and which part can we largely ignore. Yeah, we can ignore that E, and the reason why is because if you think about an E exponential function, exponential function looks like this, right? It, it hovers above the x-axis. Doesn't matter what that exponent is, it's always hovering above the x-axis, or it's either hovering above or below. It's never gonna touch zero. So that's the important thing is that we're never gonna hit zero. And if you try to also algebraically go through natural log, I'm taking natural log on both sides, you're going to see that it's not going to exist. So there's not there's not nothing that we that that we can find in terms of x intercept. So it's just going to be focusing on just this portion here, right? This negative cosecant t cotangent t. But if I want to find set this equal to zero, what can we do to make it easier or more familiar to us? We like to think in terms of sine and cosine, right? It's just easier for us. You know, circle values are, are, are going to come easier for us as well. So let's rewrite this problem, right? So cosecant is the same thing as what? On over sine. Cotangent is the same thing as cosine over sine. So if I clean all this up, this is really just negative cosine of t over sine squared of t equal to zero. Okay, so there is my, this is my 
slimmed down, cleaned up the uh, velocity function that I care about in terms of looking for a critical point. I want to figure out where velocity is zero. This is this is this is my cleaned up version of the velocity function without that exponential function getting in the way. But if I'm down to this point, what am I really looking at though? Just the what? Numerator, right? So I'm looking based on looking for an x-intercept. I'm not going to find it from a denominator, right? Then if I set my denominator to zero, then I'm looking for where velocity is undefined. We don't want that. We want where velocity is zero. And so I set negative cosine equal to zero. And worst cosine equal to zero. Five or two. I'm sorry, uh, not pi over two. B is sorry, zero. My bad, hold on, no, you're right. I was thinking sign. Uh, pi over two, three pi over two. Okay, but um, how do we know which values that we want to use? Yeah, look at your interval, right? Okay, so there's my velocity function, my velocity interval here for pi over six to pi over six. Sorry, five, five, or six. Okay. The only value that's going to land between five or six and five, five, or six, that's first and second quadrant, right? So it's that five over two here. That three, five, or two is too far out to the right. Hey, the direction says, um, sorry, particle at rest, that's part B, right? Particles at rest at T equals five over two. And then part C, find the interval where the particle is moving left, moving right, just by with because statement. So now we can build our velocity function, right? And then test our interval. Um, what can we test this against? Okay. Test it against the velocity function. Um, but we can just do an abbreviated version of the velocity function. The reason why is because we know that E is always going to produce what? A positive value, right? So it's, just, it's not going to change the sign at all. So we're just going to focus on just this part. Plug values into my abbreviated, cleaned up, easier to interpret velocity function portion. Uh, what's nice about this denominator here? It's always positive, so it's not going to affect anything. Really, just that numerator, right? Whatever that numerator sign is, is going to be the sign of my velocity in that interval. So that's nice. I just focus on just that numerator. Okay, so between pi over six, two, and pi over two, I'll choose pi over three. Between pi over two and five pi over six, I'll choose two pi over three. Okay, so cosine of pi over three, that's a positive value, but there's a negative attached to it. So 2 pi over 3, that's cosine 2 pi over 3 is positive or negative. Negative with a negative, so that gives me positive. So what can we conclude? That our particle is moving to the left, what? Pi over 6 to pi over 2, and it's moving to the right, pi over 2 to pi over 6. Yeah. And the reasoning is because either velocity is greater than 0 or because velocity is less than 0. Okay, I have a um, derivative uh, problem for us to do. It's up here on the board, and I'll uh, put it down on my um, paper as well. All right, uh, quite a few things going on here. Can we um, identify what is involved in this process to find the derivative? Listen, yeah, you see y's kind of scattered 
across your problem sphere. You got to collect your DYPXs. What else? Product rule, you see that X and cosecant cube 2Y, those are two distinct terms there. And something else that we should do before we jump into the derivative process that will be very helpful for us. Yeah, let's rewrite that cosecant, right? That cube is not um, in a good place for us. It's good for cleanup, but it's not good for our calculus process. It's, it's, it messes with the order and, and allowing us to see the necessary chain rule. A couple of reminders as well. We have a couple, um, cosecant of u. We just did that rule, um, but we have to also remember our rule for e to the u. And remember the rule for natural log of u. Okay, let's build out our derivative here. Product rule on the right side. Implicit as we collect our dy dx. Okay, so e to the y becomes e to the y times dy dx. Six natural log of y. The six stays, which is the coefficient, natural log of y becomes what? U prime over u, so what? One over y, but we just asked for y's derivative, so we also need dy dx. F prime G plus F G prime. F prime, X becomes one. K function. Copy that down, no changes. F function, no changes as well. Okay, but when we get G prime, now we got to activate what? Chain rule, yeah. So you got that outside portion, bracket cubed. You got that inside portion, cosecant of U. And all that is going to go in that space there. Okay. Bracket cube becomes three bracket squared. Inside derivative cosecant becomes negative cosecant u cotangent u times u prime. Running out of space here, but all that is for my inside derivative. Okay, so the calculus is done. Oops, sorry, I I, I missed something here. U I D S. Yep. So I have three, I have, ultimately there's four terms. This is just one really long extended term here. There's one term, second term, third term, fourth term. So there's three terms that have dy dx, so they're all going to go on the left side so that I can factor that dy dx out. Uh, this whole thing is, what's the sign for this whole term here? Positive or negative. It's a negative, right? So if I move it to the left side, it becomes a positive. Do some cleanup along the way here. Two, oh, sorry, six X.
think you guys got the same thing that I got. So now we just factor the UIDX out, put the rest of the expression in parentheses, and divide it over. I can't see yeah, why is that? It's that attached to that, that plus sign here. There's another term attached to it through addition and subtraction. So now if, if none of that was there, then yeah, we can. But as soon as something is attached to a dash, something is, something is added or subtracted to that term, oh, yeah, we can't do anything with it. Not as clean as we would like. Yeah. That again? Why does the six stay? Because it's a coefficient. It's, it tags on to the derivative, right? It's not by itself. If it was a six plus natural log of y, then we can let it go away. Right. Just like if it was like three x squared, right? The derivative of three x squared is six x, and that, that three stays with the problem. So any coefficient attached to the variable is not going to go away. It's just going to stay along um, with the derivative. Okay, questions? So this was good because um, we saw implicit, we saw um, uh, product rule. Uh, you guys uh, practice that chain rule with that trig. Uh, practice the rules that I want you to be able to know, e to the u, natural log of u. So uh, make sure you review your original six derivative rules as well as your inverse trig derivatives. Um, practice with your unit circle. Make sure you're good with all those values for your curve sketching. All right, I'll have a, um, a help session tomorrow morning. Don't forget your phones. Yeah, I'm going to I'm just going to take them. So I'm just by, by creating new, new yeah. ones, you know, I will post them up on the Yeah, I don't know.